Walkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And, of course, you can listen to the show uh, through RSS feed on YouTube. Uh, we're on Stitcher, uh, TuneIn, uh, and another one, which of course is uh, slipping my mind at the moment. Uh, and of course, you can listen to the rebroadcast of the show later on Friday nights on a host of other stations, including Awake Radio. And of course, on uh, Saturday evening, 6 to 8 on KYAH AM, uh, 540 AM in Utah. So lots of ways to listen to the show, and uh, we will have some more uh, coming up in the near future. Uh, and uh, quickly, I just wanted to thank Dorian for a very generous donation on PayPal. So thank you so much, Dorian. And I will be uh, writing, uh, responding to your email. I've just had a, a couple of things that I've uh, had to get out of the way. So, of course, you can always support me by going to uh, PayPal and making a direct donation or a repeat donation. And, of course, by going to patreon.com slash Redmond where you can support me for as little as a dollar a month. And, of course, you get access to the exclusive bonus podcast. And I'll be recording uh, the January's bonus podcast probably sometime next week. But uh, anyway, I am very excited about our show today. I am joined by two people who I have admired from afar for a long time. So it's great to finally get them on the show. Show, and we are joined by uh, former intelligence analyst and investigative reporter Wayne Madsen, whose work, of course, you can find at Wade Ma WayneMadsenReport.com, and by Andrew Krieg, who is a lawyer and author uh, who wrote uh, an excellent book, Presidential Puppetry, Obama, Romney, and Their Masters, and he is also the founder of the Justice Integrity Project, which uh, investigates official misconduct and uh, we are going to be talking about their recent investigation into the uh, ever-deepening connections between Donald Trump and Jeffrey Epstein and the links that uh, their relationship has uh, that go back to the city of Waterbury, Connecticut. And just a, a quick uh, warning, because I don't do this enough, but we will be talking about some graphic material on the show, so keep that in mind. But uh, anyway, Wayne and Andrew, uh, how are you? Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Great, good to be with you. Excellent. I feel the same. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, before we get started, because we, we always have new listeners. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping all of my listeners uh, know of uh, your work. But uh, why don't you just uh, give us a little background? You know, who is Wayne Madsen? Who is Andrew Krieg? Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start this. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I, I started... Um, out uh, in, in the Navy, uh, was assigned. My last duty station was the National Security Agency. Uh, I had always intended to go into journalism, but uh, something called the Vietnam War had intervened, uh, which uh, gave me a very low draft uh, lottery number, and I joined the Navy ROTC. And uh, after my time in the Navy, I gradually got into what my intended profession was, which was journalism, and I've been doing this ever since. Uh, so uh, trying to em basically emulate the muckraking journalists of the past, and there have been many of them, but uh, especially uh, Jack Anderson and, and before mm -hmm. him Drew Pearson, who were probably the most well-known of, of their time. Excellent. And uh, Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying I met uh, Wayne at the National Press Club when I'd taken a detour uh, from journalism. Uh, but uh, my start was growing up in New York City, uh, working as a newspaper reporter for the Hartford Current, oldest newspaper in the country, uh, and then becoming a lawyer in Washington. And... Um, as I uh, pursued the latter course, uh, 
increasingly I started saying things that didn't match up with what I had understood to be good reporting. And there were a lot of mysteries, civic mysteries, that didn't seem to be covered by the normal news media. So in 2009, I went back to being a reporter, and with the help of friends and experts like Wayne, began to understand that there's a deeper level of kind of power control that either escapes the notice of the normal media and civic institutions, including courts, or people don't want to write about it. So that's what the Justice Integrity Project is about, and that's why I'm so proud to have worked on a recent investigation with Wayne for about the last month and a half. And I'll just say that as we get into it, the results of the investigation are very congruent with both the overall mission of the American Freedom Radio and your own work, Pierce, because it involves deep and dark topics that we'd like to think the mainstream would address, but they'll find many, many excuses not to get into it. Absolutely, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of their excuses and the sort of lack of serious reporting, especially when it comes to this particular topic. But as I said, and as you were just mentioning there, Andrew, you and Wayne have been working for over a month on this particular story, and you can find it if you go to justice-integrity.org. It's the first article up on the page, and it is called Welcome to Waterbury, the City that Holds Secrets that Could Bring Down Trump. And as I said, this is a deep investigation into Donald Trump and, of course, his good pal, convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. And before we kind of dive into the specifics, how did this sort of case or this investigation come to you guys? What triggered you to look into this particular story and particularly this young woman, Maria, and the city of Waterbury, Connecticut? I'm going to hand that off to Wayne because the tip originally went to him, and that's why the story was first broken on his website, the Wayne Madsen Report, where it exists now along with many other predecessor stories. But, Wayne, why don't you tell the story of how we got started on this? Yeah, this revelation came to me via a tip. Of course, I have to vet many of these. As with other stories, you get a lot of people come forward with a story, and you've got to make sure they're legitimate, first of all. And even if the person looks legitimate, you've really got to make sure that the story isn't some sort of a payback or something like that. So it came to me by someone who had been working on this particular facet of a case that was already out there. Back in 2016, there was an individual who was first known as Jane Doe and later as Katie Johnson, who said that when she was 13, after she had been recruited from the Port Authority bus terminal, 42nd Street, New York, that she was invited repeatedly to these parties at the then mansion on Fifth Avenue, owned by Les Wexner at the time. Now, he's the guy who made his money in various stores found in shopping malls, particularly Victoria's Secrets and The Limited, I think, was another one of his. But anyway, 
at the at, at one of these parties um, um, uh, where she said, "Oh, there's influential businessmen there that can really help you in your prospective modeling career." Now, I don't know what a girl 13 would be doing in Manhattan in 1993. Um, uh, by herself, but uh, nevertheless, that's where she ended up, and um, she uh, claims that she was raped by uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, who was a billionaire investor uh, who was um, very close to this guy Wexner, and one uh, other businessman named Donald Trump, and um, uh, she brought a, a, a civil suit uh, first in California. But because um, the, the incident occurred in New York, she was uh, urged to refile in New York, which she did. And um, just prior to the November 8th election, she was ready to go with a news conference and uh, explain uh, details of the case. And she withdrew the lawsuit, citing threats against uh, her and her family, physical threats. Her attorney was Lisa Bloom who people might know from uh, her work for NBC and um, whose mother is Gloria Allred, who was very much involved in the uh, um, um, cases brought against Roy Moore in Alabama. Uh, but um, uh, in her lawsuit, there was a reference to a girl who was 12 years old, who Katie Johnson... Um, uh, said was um, uh, involved um, uh, with this uh, these parties, and uh, that Trump told Katie Johnson, "If you ever say anything about what's going on here, uh, you and your you you'll wind up like uh, Maria." Mm. And this was this twelve year old named Maria. So people uh, who were following this closely were wondering, including myself, who is Maria. Was this twelve-year-old named Maria? Now, so um, about two two months ago or two and a half months ago, I was contacted by a a, a, a source who who basically said, "Look, uh, Maria, she's still alive," and um, and so that said said about this investigation. Uh, where she was uh, last uh, seen uh, publicly was um, in Waterbury, Connecticut, standing in front of a pizza place uh, back in March of 1993 and where she was abducted. And um, she's still listing as a missing person in, uh, in the Waterbury Police Department uh, on their, on their uh, website. And... Um, but she's really not missing, and um, and that gets into this whole uh, situation where uh, there are many people, and many women have come forward with charges against Donald Trump, and uh, then we talk could talk about intimidation and threats and whatnot, and uh, and that's uh, where the story brought us. We both went to Waterbury and. I've, I've done these types of stories before where you know you're getting the runaround immediately mm. and municipal government. People think the federal and state governments are bad on covering things up. Uh, they've seen nothing unless they've dealt with municipal <laughs> governments. Right. They, they are some of the worst because everyone seen, you know, everybody knows each other. So, um, so the cover up is much more intense. Uh, and in this case, we found uh, that was the case in Waterbury. And and then uh, Waterbury also has a very uh, uh, a bad background in this type of story because they once uh, had a mayor, and, th- and this a mayor who was convicted of, of uh, for being a pedophile. And that, w- that was back in 1990. I- I'm sorry, that was back in 2000. But in 1993, this particular mayor was the state representative in the Connecticut legislature for Waterbury. So now not only do we have a small town cover up, but we also have uh, a um, background in this type of behavior by 
very uh, key politicians. So it had the makings of, of, of a major cover-up uh, with national implications, and um, that would include President Trump. Mm. And uh, the the mayor you're uh, referencing there, Wayne, is uh, Republican Mayor Phil Giordano, right? That's correct. And uh, and just for if people that um, you know, I, I'm I'm from New York, so I had a vague understanding uh, of this. Um, but uh, for people that don't know, Giordano, he was actually caught on an FBI water wiretap, right, talking about payments he made to uh, Gigi Jones, a Puerto Rican prostitute who was pimping out her 10-year-old niece and 8-year-old daughter. Um, so this is a, a pretty huge um, case. And, and, I mean, he's in jail for life, right? Well, 37 years. Um, okay. 37 days serving his time in a federal penitentiary in Arizona. Uh, but uh, this, and Andy, Andy got, uh, of course, can pick up here because Andy's background was investigating corrupt politicians in Connecticut when he was with the – with the hard recurrence. So um, Waterbury is like a ground zero for this type of uh, uh, not only just political corruption, but in this case, uh, this uh, perversion uh, by uh, a major political player, who, by the way, ran for the U.S. Senate in 2000 against, right. uh, against Joe Lieberman. Yes. And, uh, and, I want to I want to throw it to you, Andrew, to kind of just uh, flesh out the this, the corruption in Connecticut. But also, uh, you know, as you as you um, make note of in your article, you know, the the car, the current mayor of Waterbury, Neil O'Leary, uh, was the police chief when Giordano was arrested. So um, already, it, it you know, it this conjures up these images of everyone is sort of in on this or aware of this. And I would just echo uh, your earlier comment, Wayne, about, you know, municipal governments uh, covering things up even worse. And, you know, people can uh, look at um, some of the stuff I've done on the John Benet Ramsey case where, I mean, that was entirely the, the city um, uh, just completely covering up anything uh, that, that, that pointed towards something other than uh, John Benet's parents as being guilty. But, uh, Andrew, why don't you kind of flesh out a little bit for us, and then we'll, we'll dive more into uh, Maria's story specifically. But flesh out a little bit about the sort of uh, corruption uh, in Connecticut, because this is probably going to be new to a lot of listeners. Well, I, I think it would be helpful to, to start just by placing uh, a mental image of Waterbury in place and time. It's located about 75 miles northeast of New York City. It's a city of 110,000 people at the last census. It's a factory town that in the heyday of Connecticut manufacturing made uh, brass and clocks and watches. Um, but it turned uh, with the closing of these kind of factories from a kind of blue-collar town of, uh, you know, healthy working class to um, a city that has a significant poverty population. Um, and uh, so you have uh, an effort to maintain standards, but, um, but uh, you know, some significant hard times, including by a fairly significant Puerto Rican politician uh, po population. So... Um, uh, Another couple factors here uh, are, you know, the headline is about kidnapping and allegations of of rape, but there's many uh, side issues that are fascinating, important, and troubling. Um, so, for, for one thing, uh, just to stick, stick to the uh, sex part of this, um, you know, we're talking about runaway girls or other girls, and and your audience probably knows the Epstein saga. He was for sure. convicted and given the sweetheart deal, mostly for Florida um, related um, areas. This is a little different this than the Northeast, but the attraction is these glamour uh, parts of society. You know. Uh, uh, fashion, modeling, entertainment, 
beauty contests and so forth. And the idea of going to parties to very young uh, teenagers and being associated with these glamour activities, uh, this is why there's supposed to be adults around. There's supposed to be moral codes, not predators. <laughs> um, because, you know, kids should be in school not thinking of going to parties when they're 13 or something, much less being kidnapped. Um, uh, another couple factors here, and, and pardon me for a little sociological context, but um, uh, it's it's not simply about uh, sex for big shots. Wayne and I have found through the years doing a number of these stories, there's a blackmail component a lot of these sessions might be filmed and different people are being, uh, uh, they think they're having, you know, a debauched good time, but they may be captured on video. And if they get into government, uh, they can be blackmailed. Uh, and so there's consequences, uh, not just for the kids, the parents and, um, some abstract moral codes, which are important, but for society. Um, so that's part of our story, too. But another part is that um, this this town of or small city of Waterbury, um, the, the mayor, G- Giordano, uh, had some significant mafia connections. And so our story lays out um, a lot of those. Uh, drawing both on Wayne's uh, special expertise. Uh, Wayne is a, a world leader in understanding the mob connections of uh, Trump and many others, particularly with the Russian mob or or ex-Russian mob. And so it's it's very relevant that the investigation of this uh, Giordano. Uh, by the FBI was um, originally not about sex cases, but about uh, this this big builder who um, operated throughout the New Jersey, New York, Connecticut region uh, with massive uh, construction contracts, uh, and the feds were interested in him, and that's when they picked up the... Uh, sex scandal stuff, the child uh, prostitution stuff. So uh, a, a part of our story um, gets into that mob area, and uh, some of these mob contacts um, are the type of thing that uh, the special prosecutor in Washington is looking at. Now, we don't know precisely what he's looking at, but... Uh, uh, those of us who track this uh, realize that uh, money laundering, uh, mob relations, uh, this is all part of uh, uh, the larger uh, context uh, that we're talking about here. Mm. So um, I'm I'm both broadening the scope of this. Um, but also keeping a, a, a focus on the, the specific revelation of our story, Welcome to Waterbury, which was uh, we discovered that this little Puerto Rican girl, now in her 30s, is still alive when her ostensible demise had been used uh, a year and a half ago to threaten Katie Johnson to back off of her lawsuit against Trump and Epstein. Mm. So uh, we we can take it according to your questions, obviously, uh, but um, uh, there, there is a larger context here that uh, gets into complex but extremely important related topics that uh, go simply beyond... Uh, um, uh, the Waterbury connection and the fact that Maria is still alive. And I'll, I'll just add uh, briefly that our title, Welcome to Waterbury, for our story, 
with a subtitle, The City That Holds Secrets That Could Bring Down Trump. Um, it's, uh, it's an ironic title because, uh, we had asked, uh, some simple questions like, could we see the police report, uh, about the kidnapping, which I as a reporter in Connecticut you, you used to get those kind of things all the time. And, um, the, the, the authorities went into a big cover up mode and everybody were getting the runaround. He says, no, you got to talk over here. You got to go over there. You got to go over there. You got to go to the police chief. Oh, he's out. He can't give it to you. And so we go to the mayor. We go to the corporation council. And uh, to get to the point here, the corporation council, when we just said we'd, we'd like to see the report of the kidnapping from 25 years ago, they didn't like our attitude. They didn't like our <laughs> question. And she said, well, I, I was prepared to say welcome to Waterbury, but, uh, I, what did she say exactly, Wayne? Uh, she, she said, yeah, I was going to say welcome to Waterbury, but based on, uh, um, your, this, this being a hostile, um, your hostile stance or something to that effect, she said, uh, yeah, I, I'll just say we'll wait for your official, uh, a request uh, uh, under the Freedom of Information Law of the State of Connecticut, which is, you know, we'll, we'll see you in some sort of uh, hearing or, you know, br- bring on your bring on your official request and uh, complain or whatever. Yeah, and we uh, the the hostile remark. I, I guess I was doing the talking, but I, I'd said uh, just by way of introduction that I'd worked for the state's. Uh, for the Hartford Current, the state's largest newspaper for 14 years. And, uh, you know, I actually, uh, enjoyed very good relations covering the police departments and the courts and all of that. And, um, uh, I, I thought I was just introducing myself in a, a more or less, uh, uh, friendly, way but just saying that uh I was used to doing this type of story and uh they uh chose to take that as some kind of implied threat. So you know what really got their dander up is uh um Andy has a colleague in Connecticut who uh had uh, uh filed a, a, another freedom of information request on another missing person case in Waterbury and had to take the city uh, before the Connecticut Freedom Information Commission. So, um, and he won after a lot of, uh, back and forth. He, and he, a hearing, uh, where the corp, uh, Waterbury attorney and the mayor, the current mayor, uh, O'Leary had to go and, uh, present their side in this case. And ultimately, it was found in, uh, in, 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 uh, favor of the journalists, um, uh, who brought the, the action. Uh, but, uh, uh, when his name was mentioned, of course, it raised the uh, <laughs> hackles with the, uh, mm-hmm. with the city attorney. So she, she didn't like that at all. But this, again, this gets back to a, this, uh, Waterbury, uh, being a, a, a problem and covering up, uh, and denying the press, uh, uh, key documents, uh, in, um, in, 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 ca- in cases uh, like this. Mm. Let's, uh, let's, let's dive into some specifics here. Um, is there any, without obviously, uh, revealing, uh, you know, personal information or anything like that? I mean, Maria was 12 years old, uh, when she was abducted. Uh, actually, outside. she was, uh, she was 11. Oh, 11. I'm sorry. 11 years uh, she old. She was 12 years old when Donald Trump and Epstein allegedly sodomized her. Okay. So she was 11 when she was abducted outside of Nash's Pizza in Waterbury, Connecticut. Is there anything, uh, about, you know, uh, that you can, uh, tell us in, in relation to this abduction? Because this is slightly different, uh, from much of Epstein's sort of, uh, MO is, uh, enticing slightly older girls, uh, to, you know, 
recruit essentially younger girls in order to give him massages. Obviously, there is also the, the allegations of people like Jean-Luc Brunel who were importing uh, underage girls from France and the Balkans and stuff for Epstein. But um, do we know if Epstein was involved in the kidnapping of Maria or uh, is this just, you know, these people no, know each other? No. There's no evidence to suggest that. And you're right. I, I actually, I, I investigated Epstein long before this, this, uh, uh, matter came up. I, when the judge in, uh, uh, Palm, uh West Palm Beach, uh, in the Epstein matter, you know, there was a gag, uh, there was like a, not only a gag order, but he sealed documents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, in the case. And the, the, the moment that U.S. judge unsealed those documents, I was in the, federal courthouse in West Palm Beach at the terminals uh, and that's where I first discovered we knew about like four Jane Doe's or were Jane Doe's one through four one of which had, one of which Virginia Roberts had actually been recruited by Epstein's recruiter while she was a towel girl underage uh, at where Mar-a-Lago um, of course this is during the time Trump uh, had that had that place so um, but then I looking through the documents uh, that had been just unsealed, I then look at a, a, a reference. There's references to Jane Doe 103, yeah. which means that, you know, if you're dealing, first of all, with Jane Doe's one through four, and then all of a sudden you see Jane Doe 103, there's a lot of Jane Doe's in between. And uh, I, I find the number interesting because it just came out um, uh, that during the, uh, 2016 election, uh, Trump's real estate attorney, Mark Kazowitz, and this is according to Steve Bannon, Mark Kazowitz uh, supposedly had to take care of a hundred women. So, you know, we have 104 <laughs> down in, uh, and not counting. I mean, we had, we knew about the four Jane Doe's, uh, a mm. little bit about them anyway. And, uh, then there's this reference to 104. Uh, but yeah, uh, the, 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 the what we understand is is that there is uh, obviously there is a trafficking ring, uh, unfortunately, in in in, in children, and uh, and and of course we know that um, Giordano was h- hiring a Puerto Rican prostitute, not for her, but for her. Uh, sh- he wanted the uh, um, you know to have uh, sex with her. Uh, eight-year-old uh, niece and her ten-year-old daughter, which uh, is like, uh, you know, this is the mayor. And what's more uh, appalling is that it was the FBI who nailed him, not the Waterbury police. And the chief of the police at the time, uh, the current mayor, Neil O'Leary, uh, you, you know, just you just you look at that and you say, what in the world is wrong with people? Putting these kinds of individuals with that kind of record in office, uh, or lack of, you know, that that's the fact that the mayor was doing this, and 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 the local police, it took the FBI to come in and do something, and not the local police, makes you kind of wonder. But what we understand is what happened to Maria. She was, uh, it looks like she was picked up by a. Um, uh, uh, a ring, a, a kidnapping ring that uh, just would then farm these uh, children out to other people. So there's no direct link between the kidnapping, of course. And I would say at the, by the time uh, a girl like Maria wound up in the Wexner mansion in Manhattan, uh, that uh, the, the degrees of separation were probably enough uh, to make the end user uh look like they had nothing to do with the actual kidnapping. Right. And uh, do we know how many times Maria was uh, at the uh, Epstein's mansion and how many times she uh, was forced to have sex with Trump and Epstein? Yeah, I think according to the lawsuit filed by Katie Johnson, it was about three three or maybe, do you remember, Andy, was it three or four times she was seen Uh at these parties? Because she had seen her there before. So when Trump said, have you ever talked about this? You 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 wind up like Maria. That was based on previous encounters there. Yeah, I uh, I don't I don't recall the number exactly. I I seem to recall it being more like uh, not as many as Katie Johnson because again, um, uh, it's Katie Johnson's suit 
So Maria is a more subsidiary figure. Um, the, Kenny Johnson did have a couple of supporting witnesses. And part of the reason, but uh, Maria was not one of them. And part of the reason to uh, both try to respond to your question, but also uh, underscore where we, we'd like to see this going in terms of importance, is that um, uh, if Maria, who was not uh, documented in the original lawsuit with her experiences in depth, because she was more of a, a figure that uh, had disappeared, uh, but if she's still alive, she could be a supporting witness to all of this that could revive things. Mm. But uh, to the extent that all of these people are scared, uh, that's part of the importance of getting the story out, even though um, uh, it's uh, it's fraught with still with danger and a few gaps in terms of the information, frankly. Mm. And then uh, another thing, because uh, you mentioned in the article when you were uh, speaking with uh, corporate counsel Linda Weebe, or something, Weeby. I think that's Weeby, excuse me, yeah. Weeby. Um, you know, it was just increasingly cagey, I guess, with all of your questions. She 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 revealed to you that said sometime around 2012, 2013, there was some interest by law enforcement and a few journalists regarding Maria's case. Um, and can you give us an idea, but do, do you know what that was really in reference to? Why was there interest? And what's the sort of sense that you got uh, talking to people in Waterbury about Maria's disappearance? You know, is there anything that they, they were able to kind of fill you in on? Any sort of ideas uh, about what might have happened to or where she might have been uh, during this time? Well, uh, let me take the first part of that and leave the second uh, to Wayne, but uh, it was a passing remark by uh, the Corporation Council of Waterbury, and one of the things that we'd like to follow up on uh, that we believe we're entitled to under uh, Freedom of Information precedent is who were these journalists uh, and uh, who, who were the law enforcement. And, and that um, uh, should be part of the disclosure that we'll be pursuing but uh, their uncooperative stance uh, closed that off. Now, before handing it over for what we found in Waterbury to Wayne, let me mention that uh, one of the things that makes this kind of reporting important, but also difficult, is that um, there's a lot of gray areas here and particularly when you're talking about very serious criminal offenses, potentially involving extremely rich and powerful people, um, uh, you, you, every single alleged fact, you have to think, well, is that really the case? And let me illustrate it here briefly. When somebody says, oh, there were journalists looking at it, well, we, we not only want to know who they were, uh, but were they really journalists? Mm. And if somebody says, oh, there were law enforcement people, well, were they really law enforcement people or were they former law enforcement people who were flashing a badge and um, pretending to be law enforcement? And the, the reason if uh, Maria is and these other girls are under threats there are all kinds of people who can be well paid to pretend to be journalists and and try to get information and then sell it to the highest bidder mm. who's not us by the way but <laughs> right and and, um, and who then go and and threaten the girls <laughs> so you know it's not just uh curiosity when we want to know who who these people are but uh Wayne more than me, but I, I certainly read about it, have dealt with plenty of people who call themselves journalists who are really not. They're, they're 
they're phony or they're part-time journalists and they're really um, uh, almost like private eyes working for the bad guys. And, and Andy, you managed to say that all that without even using the awful phrase fake news. Oh, well, <laughs> this, is a, yeah. this is a red letter day. Uh, <laughs> uh, but any, uh, yeah, I just add uh, on the other part of the question is, um, uh, you know, the, the Waterbury has this very large Puerto Rican community, and obviously, you know, uh, there's a lot of crime in that community because the economy dropped out of the uh, from the ta- you know out of the bottom of the town there's not a whole lot of work there and then especially after Trump's uh dealing with uh, the aftermath of uh the Hurricane Maria oddly enough the same name as the uh girl we're talking about who was kidnapped um, in Puerto Rican the official Puerto Rican community is sort of like uh, uh you know the deer caught in headlights, uh, you know, especially when you start mentioning Trump. Uh, and, but what we managed to ascertain from the community is, uh, that the, the kidnappers of the girl were not from, uh, Waterbury. And, uh, Maria's mother, who died a few years ago, uh, said apparently, I know she's alive, my daughter, and she's in New York. Now, this I think was right after sometime right after the kidnapping. So uh, that's why the police report would be very helpful because the police, if they did their job properly, would have taken witness statements if there had been an out-of-state ta- out tag seen in the area or maybe the, if somebody saw the actual car pull up and, and snatch the girl, uh, they might have seen whether what, you know, plates were on the car, what uh, what kind of car was it? Was it a high-end vehicle? Uh, and, uh, and other things that could really, uh, uh, help, uh, and you would think, um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the, the idea that, uh, now the city of Waterbury is treating a cold, what's essentially a cold case now all of a sudden as a hot case. Well, what are, you know, what are they doing? Uh, this mm. happened in 1993. Well, why, why all of a sudden are they treating this like it happened, you know, uh, two months ago? Uh, and I think, you know, that, that's where we get back to the, uh, the, the, the cities in cover up mode. Mm, absolutely. Well, and, and, and this is sort of not releasing the police report, especially on a case so long ago. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's just what's in that case that they don't want you to see or that they're going to drag their feet, you know, uh, for I guess as long as they possibly can until you formally, you know, submit a FOIA request or something to get that. Um, but of course, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see what's in that police report. I mean, I, I almost, uh, you know, I have a fear there's, there's going to be like nothing in it, you know? Or, or they're would... going to heavily redact it to the point where it's like, you know, when you do federal Freedom of Information Act requests, you get something back and, uh, you know, the, the only thing that's not been redacted are the page numbers. Right, uh, exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and what we, we, we went in with an open mind, uh, just expecting they'd be cooperative. I mean, uh, the America that I used to know as a reporter in Connecticut for 14 or 15 years, uh, you know, it's, uh, the default is officer friendly. You know, you, you go and you ask for the report, you get the report. And maybe they say, you know, we, we gotta, you know, cut out two paragraphs or something like that. And, uh, you understand. And sure, you understand. Uh, but here, uh, it's a total runaround. And, uh, you, you know, certainly until the, the recent end of the, the process, we thought, you, you know, we have no reason to think on its face that the current mayor and police chief are deep into cover-up mode for the, you know, the people that were convicted and sent to prison. I mean, just because you worked at the same time as people doesn't mean you're in on it, particularly if you're not indicted, not implicated, and promoted. So we, we, we had an open mind, but it's kind of like that great uh, Spencer Tracy movie, Bad Day at Black Rock. The guy comes into this town to deliver a medal to 
the authorities for a veteran that's been killed and everybody treats Spencer Tracy like he's the big villain because they got a big secret. So we're thinking, look, these people can just give us the report and act normal and redact part of it if they think it's that sensitive. But they've chosen to go into this big cover-up mode and uh, and gee, by one amazing coincidence, the thing seems to point to the White House. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and to, uh, yeah. Little, go uh, ahead, jump in, Wayne. I was just going to say, Andy, you might want to add a, a, a you know, a, a juxtapose Waterbury with Palm Beach, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, and uh, how after Epstein got that sweetheart deal from the U.S. Attorney in the state of Florida. What the, what the West Palm Beach police did, uh, when there was like, uh, you know, um, you, you know, Epstein's lawyers didn't want any more information coming out about, uh, the Jane Doe victims there and what, what the detective did down there. Well, obviously Wayne knows the story, but, uh, uh, I'll, uh, take the baton that he's handed off. Uh, it, and as your listeners know, uh, Epstein got this incredible sweetheart deal down in uh, Florida uh, where he ended up serving uh, uh, 13 months at nighttime only uh, in jail. And, you know, here were 30, 40, and potentially more uh, victims. And, and, of course, for any new listeners, we're talking about junior high school girls and high school girls. These are not you know, 19 year olds, but for the most part. So he, he gets this big sweetheart deal from the U.S. attorney who now happens to be the U.S. Secretary of Labor, Alexander Acosta, who's supposed to be watching out for the working people across the country as Secretary of Labor, but he's the guy who, um, arranged this deal in, uh, uh, is in the jurisdiction of Miami. And um, the, to follow up Wayne's point, uh, the police down in uh, West Palm Beach who knew about this, you know, horrible depredations for years against the junior high and high school girls, they uh, got so ticked off that some, somebody put the specifics of what Epstein was doing on the Internet, taking out the names of the girls just so that the world would know what they, uh, yeah, they what, were like excerpts from their police reports. Right, yeah. right. And so they had to come from the police. I don't think anybody's ever found out who did it, but they they did protect the identities of the girls. But the the most amazing part of that uh, plea deal, and your listeners already know this, I'm sure, but uh, just briefly as a reminder, was the authorities said as part of the plea that there won't be any investigation or indictment of anybody else. And so that left uh, whoever the, 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 the other co-conspirators might be totally off the hook. Most immediately, the recruiters of the girls, who should have been doing pay, paying some kind of penance, but also the the world famous VIPs, whoever they are, possibly including Trump, possibly including Bill Clinton, who is a, a frequent flyer on that Lolita Express air, airplane that uh, Epstein had. But um, so we're, we're looking at a, a legal system that will not expose this stuff except isolated good guys, let's say in the uh, Palm Beach uh, Police Department, but not necessarily in Waterbury or in the U.S. Attorney's Office, <laughs> and uh, and maybe not in the White House either. Well, and I, always, I always found it fascinating, and I'm sure we'll talk a bit more in the second hour about uh, Acosta, but, you know, Acosta went on this... Uh, somewhat charm offensive and, you know, had a, a sympathetic journalist, Conchita Sarnoff, who's covered this case and has some very, um, you know, 
I, I would say suspicious reasons behind you know why she's covering it, you know. But she helped uh, publish his letter where he portrayed himself as you know the good guy trying to fight for the victims, yeah. and that it was really Epstein and his lawyers who were messing with him, you know. And then again, lo and behold, people kind of bought into that story that Acosta was the good guy, and now he's uh, sitting quite comfortably as Secretary of Labor, and there's, there's no way that's a coincidence. Um, yeah. You know, right. <laughs> It, 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 Sarnoff, of course, is the granddaughter of David Sarnoff, yes. the founder of uh, of NBC. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and actually, also the founder, in a way, of ABC because the, it was originally it was uh, they were uh, two networks, the Red Network and the Blue Network. I think it was Blue that became. ABC. So uh, you're, t- you're talking about a grandfather in modern broadcasting. Then you wonder why the media is not covering yes a story <laughs> like this. Well, here's one other element, and we can say this, I think, because of uh, your background and your listeners' understanding of this, but uh, the, there's heavy cross-pollination between the, uh, let's call it the intelligence sector, and some of these uh, media organizations at the ownership level. So, um you know, we. I know. I know you've done shows on that. Uh, you know, Hollywood and mm. all kinds of other things. But we just gotta, uh, without going too far off the beam, say these are factors to be considered. Um, and uh, from the reporting perspective, you know, uh, a lot of young reporters or other reporters who don't. Uh, have a specialty in this, they might well go to somebody like her and say, "Oh, she's interested in this stuff. Uh, she must be an expert," and and um, and quote that statement uh, without realizing all these connections. I'll just add one other th- thing, though, as we try to assess Acosta's credibility. It happens that he's been involved in cover-ups of two of the other major cases that came before him as U.S. attorney. And one was the Jack Abramoff scandal. Right. And another was, I don't know if you've gotten into this on another show, but uh, he was the the U.S. attorney who handled the Swiss banking scandal in which instead of going after the bankers – and their customers, when he was given a list of 19,000 U.S. people who had secret bank accounts in the United Bank of Switzerland by a whistleblower, Brad Birkenfeld, they they put Birkenfeld in prison <laughs> and really didn't pursue um, the list, although the IRS was interested enough to recoup $15 billion from these tax cheats. But uh, Acosta and the rest of the Justice Department, they were most interested in shutting up the whistleblower, Brad Birkenfeld. Mm. So it's not as if, uh, by the way, who wrote a very good book about this. It came out a year and a half ago. It's called Lucifer's Banker. After he got out of prison, he wrote this book. So it's not as if um, somebody like Acosta... uh, just has the Epstein cover up on his uh, hidden resume. <laughs> He's right, doing right. A lot of other things. <laughs> well, and I, I'm sure that you know his uh, previous history with you know Abramoff and Swiss banks. I mean, this probably qualified him to uh, you know uh, aid in in a cover up involving uh, this mysterious billionaire pedophile and a who's who of celebrities and politicians and. Uh, rich, you know, people that hobnob in, in, uh, high society. So I'm sure, uh, th- this all helped him, you know, in order to do this. But we, we are at the break right now and we will continue this conversation with Wayne Madsen and Andrew Creek. So stay tuned.
to the world's meeting place. American. It's practically narcotic. Freedom. Oh, yes. I like very much. Radio. You're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high fructose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network, and, uh, and we just need that so much. I don't like words that hide the truth. I don't like words that conceal reality. I don't like euphemisms. And American English is loaded with euphemisms. Because Americans have a lot of trouble dealing with reality. Americans have trouble facing the truth. So they invent the kind of a soft language to protect themselves from it. I'll give you an example of that. When I was a little kid, if I got sick, they wanted me to go to the hospital and see the doctor. Now they want me to go to a health maintenance organization. Smug, greedy, well-fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore. They neutralize people. The government doesn't lie and engages in disinformation. Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? They never mention that part of it to us, do they? Never mention that part of it. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio in service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. We can control the old out. Mind to experience American Freedom Radio. Hawkins 
Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. Geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are joining us here in the second hour, we are joined once again uh, by Wayne Madsen and Andrew Krieg. Of course, you can find Wayne's work at waynemadsenreport.com, and you can find Andrew's work at justice-integrity.org. And uh, we have been discussing the Jeffrey Epstein case, particularly with a focus on uh, the connections to Donald Trump. Uh, we were talking about uh, Wayne and Andrew's article, Welcome to Waterbury, the city that holds secrets that could bring down Trump. And uh, we were we were just chatting uh, during the break there um, because, uh, you know, I, I obviously have spent, I don't know how many hours now covering this on the show and looking up docket sheets and court documents. And there is, of course, quite a lot, you know, happening in the background. There's a, a lawsuit right now. Um, here in New York against uh, Epstein, uh, Maxwell, Sarah Kellen, a Hulk, uh, other uh, cast of characters, uh, uh, Marchenkova, I believe, is is involved in that. There's another lawsuit happening in Palm Beach. So there are these things. And then, you know, of course, I was so excited to see uh, that you had written something about this as well with some new information. But um, – in in my mind, in the public's mind, there is this sort of like, ah, oh, whatever, it's not a big thing. Yet, we keep seeing these little nuggets um, popping up. And uh, I want to kind of get your take on this. I mean, one of them, of course, is um, there was a, uh, a, a comment that uh, Bannon made uh, directly referencing Katie Johnson's rape uh, by Donald Trump that he made in an interview with Vanity Fair. Um, there was this revelation in the uh, now defunct uh, magazine Maximum Golf that in 2000 Trump actually held up his private plane so that Epstein could uh, could get on it and fly back to New York. And this, again, kind of paints this fuller picture that these two men are not casual acquaintances. Um, they weren't, um, you know, as Trump would, would later put it, oh, he was just a, some member of my club at Mar-a-Lago and I kicked him out when I found out he was doing bad things. Um, you know, and while no one legally has been able to kind of implicate them in, in any serious sort of a, a crime or anything, the picture that's being painted here is that these two men are, were quite close. Uh, and one can only assume that they were doing illegal things together. And I, I guess I want to just kind of get your take on uh, some of the, these new things. And I mean, and the way in which... Uh, the media, and particularly the public, just kind of pretends like it's not happening. And, and what do you guys make of that? Well, let me let me uh, before getting into the specifics, say that one of the things that, as an attorney and also an experienced reporter in this, that is needs to be said and is often missing um, from these conversations. But it's that. Uh, the exact answers to these questions could be found if the legal system and uh, the public uh, demanded it. Mm. So, for example, uh, all that's needed is for uh, a proper uh, authorities to convene a grand jury uh, and at some point within the statute of limitations bring in people and ask them questions about it. And then they either lie and are in danger of perjury or not. Now, the statute of limitations on some of these sex things has expired, but the reason that there are lawsuits is defamation and so forth. Mm. But uh, I'll just give a very clear example from my experience as a reporter um, in Connecticut many years ago. Uh, I got a tip that the head of a local head of a agency was using carpenters from the agency to build a dog house in his backyard. And, um, uh, you know, he didn't want to talk to me, and I wrote a little story saying no comment. 
and the federal prosecutors convened a grand jury, and within a week, they had him down there, and they got the answer that he had been building a doghouse, and he had to resign. And, you know, that's building a doghouse. Right, right, right. Employees, they know how to do this. They can do it. And what's needed is an aroused public that, when they hear about these things, doesn't just say, oh, well, forget about it. And they, in one way or another, express the desires of free citizens to say, we want answers. And they can get answers. But I'll let Wayne deal with some of the specifics of your questions, because he's written quite a bit of it about it. Well, on the Trump relationship with Epstein, there's also an interview that Trump gave, I think, back in 2000 or so, around that time frame, where he said, oh, yeah, Jeff and I have been good friends for 15 years. Good friends. I mean, good friends are good friends. Now, of course, Trump might think everybody's his good friend, but there's clearly a relationship. And I think what was more interesting was with the Bannon interview with Vanity Fair, it was in reaction to Ivanka Trump and what she said about Roy Moore and the allegations against him in Alabama. She said, you know, there's a special place in hell for people who abuse kids. And Bannon's response to Vanity Fair was, what about the allegations about her father and that 13-year-old? That was direct reference to Katie Johnson, who said she had to drop her suit because of threats against her and her family back in early November of 2016. So now a lot of people will disagree with Bannon on a lot of things, including myself. But the guy, you know, look at where he's been. Look at what he was involved with. First of all, he was involved with this Cambridge Analytics, which was funded by the Mercer family, these billionaires. And that's a deep data mining tool. So Cambridge Analytics can take information and basically put together a dossier. And they can also do target marketing and target campaigning and whatnot. But a guy like Bannon, when he gives credence to the Katie Johnson story, tells me he's got other information or else he wouldn't have said it. Here's one other place he's been. Today, Tuesday, he was before the House Intelligence Committee. Right, right. And so we don't know what he was asked. But again, this is where an aroused public comes in. You know, and it would be very interesting to know if one of those House members said, what did you mean about this Katie Johnson suit? Or are they going to treat it like, oh, we don't want to talk about sex or anything like that? Well, maybe they should. I mean, you know, you get very abstract concepts, money laundering, Russian influence. Well, let's see if either the House members today or next week when the special counsel might be subpoenaing him, whether they ask about these very simple things. And maybe he doesn't know 100 percent, but what made you talk about Katie Johnson? Let's see if they're asking that question or they just sweep it under the rug for some reason. And we also know that Trump made a comment in the past that he once was over at Epstein's place in Palm Beach. Now, that's not very far from Mar-a-Lago. Palm Beach is a very narrow barrier island. And so if you could actually walk, although nobody would walk in Palm Beach, you'd just, you know, get in their Mercedes or Lamborghini, whatever. But Trump said he was at Epstein's place and he noticed a lot of young kids in Epstein's swimming pool. And he said, what a nice guy. You know, he lets the neighborhood kids use his pool. 
I mean, it, 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 you know, Trump is either incredibly stupid or he was just kind of that was a well, I, that's that's arguable too. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, how could a guy like Trump, knowing Epstein's background, have you know, how could he have meant anything? Oh yeah, you know, what a nice guy letting. And, but he also Trump has said, oh yeah, everybody knows that Epstein likes him on the young side. So by Trump's own comments, we know that Trump knows all about Epstein, even if you were to discard uh, the Katie Johnson and the other lawsuits as frivolous. Say you were going to do that. What about these other comments, and what about the comments made by people like Bannon uh, and other people who have been close to Trump? Mm. Oh, and the the Bannon comment did, uh, I think we were in agreement in this. I mean, that struck me as um, you know, that he either, like you, you guys are saying, knows more or believed it. You know, he truly believes that that, that, that happened, that this woman is not a liar, uh, at least in this case. And, you know, I was, I mean, I was shocked that he said that in a major publication, but then even more shocked that it was like a blip. You know, nobody cared about that. It yeah, was like, remember, oh, whatever. Right. Remember, Bannon supported Roy Moore. So this was like yeah. almost like opposition. Some opposition research being used yes. against uh, Trump, uh, you know, uh, the, the Trump people. Mm. Oh, and this was the same thing when the Daily Beast reported on this uh, guy, Corcoran, who was a journalist at Maximum Golf, you know, and the, the headline of that article was that, you know, Trump had uh, used the P word again in, in, in a lewd way and was talking about a young socialite um, and, you know, f- first rate. You get it, you know. Um, that was the headline, and then buried all the way at the bottom of the article um, is this 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 uh, piece where, where where Corcoran, the journalist, is describing being on the tarmac in his private plane, and Trump is holding it up so that Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein can fly back with them to New York. I mean, so now we've got. Trump is, they're flying on Trump's plane. Trump has flown on Epstein's plane. I mean, and it, it, you, I mean, I kind of just stand here pulling my hair out sometimes. You know, just, I mean, what do you need? Do you need a videotape of these guys together? Um, I mean, there are, there are numerous pictures of them hanging out. Um, yet it, it's just sort of, uh, it, it's never really picked up. I mean, it, I don't know what you'd have to do to convince, you know, his most ardent, uh, right wing supporters and fanatics. I um, mean, seemingly nothing will convince them. Well, um, that's because, that's because uh, and I know a lot of them, uh, and I'm friendly with a lot of them, uh, that's in part because uh, this stuff all insults their intelligence, but also their policy goals. So mm-hmm. they look on Trump as someone who will achieve... Uh, even if he's not paying attention, he'll appoint people who will do what they want elsewhere. Uh, I, I'll just pick up on one of your other points. Uh, you said, what what more can be used to convince uh, Trump supporters? Uh, there was another very prescient uh, and I thought unique uh, commentary by a New Yorker writer last uh, November, and she said, well, it's not just the Trump supporters. It's kind of the middle of the road skeptics who want more proof from the woman. Mm. And this writer, I, it's kind of a complicated name that I can't remember, but um, she's in the appendix of the story I did on the Justice Integrity Project. She's, she, she made the point, look, they've stepped forward. They've filed lawsuits. They've gotten threatened. What more do we expect them to do? I mean, it's up to us and the public to do something. Um, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because <laughs> um, no, like you said, I mean, they're they're doing everything that they're supposed to be doing. Um, I want to get your your guys' take on uh, something else, and this was a, a listener of mine pointed this out to me. But in uh, Michael Wolff's new book, Fire and Fury, there is in fact a reference to Jeffrey Epstein. And uh, Wolf is talking about uh, Trump's close friend, Tom Barack, uh, the real estate investor, and he's the CEO of um, Colony Capital, which is a private equity firm. And I think at one point, uh, Trump wanted to appoint Barack as chief of staff. And according to Wolf, 
Trump, Barack, and Epstein were, quote, a 1980s and 90s set of nightlife musketeers. And uh, Wolf also states that, that Epstein has remained close to Tom Barack. And uh, I wonder, and I want to get your take on this, I mean, is, is uh, could this have been one of the reasons that Trump wanted uh, to appoint Barack as chief of staff? I mean, to just sort of keep tabs on all this. And what do you make of this? Do you guys have anything on Tom well, Barack? Well, given given uh, given uh, Trump appointing Acosta, the, the guy that did right, the, right. <laughs> the labor secretary, it, it would stand to reason, <coughs> excuse me, he would want somebody like Barack, especially if Barack is involved. Now, I I covered the Republican convention in Cleveland. This was this was you know amazing that n- none of the stalwarts of the GOP were there uh, for the most part, but. Uh, uh, Bar- uh, Tom Barack gave the sort of the intro speech uh, for uh, Trump that evening, uh, and, and uh, it was quite clear that this guy is in love with Trump, um, mm. which is a, kind of amazing given Barack uh, Barack's background. Uh, he's a uh, he's an Arab American, I believe Syrian, maybe Lebanese, but that was one country many years ago. Uh, and, and, and given, uh, Trump's, uh, animosity towards, uh, you know, well, Muslims in particular and Arabs in general, uh, now granted Tom Barak, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, his lineage is, uh, is, uh, uh, Christian, but from <coughs> Syria, the Syria Lebanon region, uh, it, it defies logic. Why would a guy like Tom Barak have a friend like, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, Trump. And, and more particularly, why would he have a friend like Epstein? Because, uh, Epstein, uh, his, uh, if you look at his background with Les Wexner, uh, who got his start in Columbus, Ohio, uh, Wexner was involved in, uh, basically the same sort of, uh, uh, dodgy business connections, uh, where you would certainly not expect to find any Arab American, uh, particularly, I'm, you know, talking in terms of, uh, you know, organized crime of the Meyer Lansky, uh, Roy Cohn, uh, as their defense mm-hmm. attorney variety. So. Oh, did, oh I'm I, sorry. I thought I lost you there, Wayne. Sorry. There's, quite, <laughs> um, there, there's questions there. So. Uh, <laughs> But what, what 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 could be the tie that binds uh, Barack uh, to these other individuals? Uh, you know, you just uh, uh, it, it, I think it's I think it's suspicious. Mm. Oh yeah, definitely. And and again, it, it's uh, it just strikes me that uh, you know now we've got Michael Wolf, uh, you know, referencing this, uh, and again, it just sort of goes the wayside. Um, of course, you know, everyone wants to uh, talk endlessly about, you know, the most gossipy parts of Fire and Fury uh, and not that, uh, according to Wolf, and I would, you know, I, I, I guess I'd hope he has some source on this, but that Barack and Epstein are still friends. Well, let, let me say something about Wolf and, you know, he's and Trump just, you know, not long ago, a few days ago, referred to him as mentally unbalanced. Uh, mm. uh, again, Trump projecting. Um, right. Now, Wolf... I've been familiar with some of Wolf's work. He did a he did a major investigation of Rupert Murdoch and News Corporation. Where I, you know, I, I his background is covering media. Uh, he, you know, he's a reporter. His official credentials are with the Hollywood Reporter, which is the other major paper out in uh, you know the in, uh, entertainment industry. Uh, Variety being the other one. Mm-hmm. So he, his bread and butter is, is like this type, this kind of, this uh, dish, this gossip, this, this kind of thing. And, uh, does that mean he gets all his facts? I, I heard, I heard just the other day somebody was saying, I know Michael Wolf's work. He, when he wrote a book on the internet, he, he, uh, had me giving a speech, uh, in Laguna Beach, California. A place where I have never been in my life. However, everything he had, he said about my speech was correct. So, mm. if we're talking about those kinds of errors, look, I know the, how editors, you know, a lot of publishers do not provide very good editing these days. And if you're, 
you know, if you're working on a faulty memory, those mistakes are easy to make. I've made those types of mistakes on people's names and whatnot. So, but, but, that, that, but just to, you know, but, but, but for somebody to Trump, uh, Trump and his supporters, like Trump and his supporters to say, Wolf, you know, he, does, he, he gets everything wrong. That's certainly not the case, uh, on these major exposés uh, that are found in his uh, books, the last, the last one, and, and the one on uh, Murdoch. Well, I've got that Murdoch book in my hand here. Uh, it's the title is "The Man Who Owns the News: Inside the Secret World of Rupert Murdoch." It was published in 2008, 446 uh, pages. I'm not. Uh, uh, totally familiar with the contents but uh looking at the back cover you know he's got um you know uh nice commendations for his books from the new york times the sunday times the financial times the atlantic monthly so the guy he he, he started as a copy boy at the new york times in 1974 he a, a critic media critic for new york magazine for the Trump White House to act like he just stumbled off the back of a pickup truck and ended up sitting in the White House couch for uh, nine or ten months is preposterous. <laughs> oh, it's also, I mean, they were granting him interviews, you know? I mean, it just sort of goes, if, if Trump really thought this guy was an idiot, I mean, why was he letting him sit down with him privately? I, I think Steve Bannon, uh, well, I think it's pretty clear that Steve Bannon's a guy that uh, gave him that kind of access. And I think Bannon did it as an insurance policy mm. for exactly yeah. what <laughs> befell Bannon later on. I don't think right. Bannon fully ever trusted Trump. Who would? Who mm. would trust this guy? <laughs> and I think, uh, uh, you know, I, I think Bannon brought him in as a chronicler. You know, to cr- oh. you know, you gather all this stuff, and if I ever need this stuff, boom. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and, and, and it might be worth uh, since uh, to draw a distinction on the word interviews, uh, particularly in uh, very sensitive uh, areas. Um, um, we we think of an interview normally as uh, a prearranged situation where the reporter pulls out their pad and people, you know, almost almost like this. This is like an interview, but um, particularly in the areas that uh, Wolf is dealing with at the White House or that Wayne has dealt with in national security. Um, a lot of the information is so sensitive that if the reporter pulled out the tape recorder and pad, they really wouldn't get anything. Mm-hmm. So it's um, the reader's got to take a little bit on faith, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth hearing, I think. Uh, so, for example, in the Wolf book, I would bet it's uh, a lot of the stuff is somebody saying, oh, guess what I heard last night? I was with so-and-so who said, you know, X. Now, that's kind of an interview, but it's not the so-and-so sitting down and saying, oh, yeah, this is what I said. Uh, But um, uh, you're never going to get people to sit down with the tape recorder and the notepad and part of the reason that um, the other reporters uh, while they may quibble with some factual small points um, they, they've they had many of these conversations themselves and they just don't have enough of it for um, a book length uh, treatment or um they weren't on the couch for nine months. Plus right? that, plus a lot of them in the White House press corps were jealous that Wolf managed to get his hands on a no access required mm. pass. They're, they're all basically told to stay in the, in the press, uh, area. Um, and, and here Wolf is, you know, having access into the outer office of the Oval Office. Um, uh, and, and and I think a lot of that was just pure jealousy. How come he gets a pass like that? How come we got to sit in the basement here <laughs> in right, the West Bank? Right. Yeah. 
Right. Well, and also, I, I mean, just, you know, I don't know, if my final word on Michael Wolff's book, I mean, you know, we can, like you said, you can nitpick and dismiss all these things, but there's like nothing that I've seen in the book that doesn't basically just, it's like yet another confirmation, you know, oh, that yeah. Trump is a child, that yeah. nobody even, thinks even he's... Critics- even as critics have had to concede that much. Uh, exactly, exactly. And this, you know, and, and to kind of link it in with, uh, you know, what we were talking about with this conversation is it's, you know, your story yet again just confirms more that Epstein and Trump are closer than we think. You know, I mean, it's all of these stories are basically just sort of confirming that this this man is, is uh, you know, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Um, and he is, you know, he's getting caught doing and saying these, these ridiculous things. And the Wolf book is just, I mean, there have been numerous stories now that have come out about, you know, uh, how much of a child he can be, how he, you know, complains about, I mean, th- this whole comment, um, you know, talking about, uh, you know, blank hole countries. I mean, it's like, come on, this is, th- that's like, you know, just a, another day in the office for this idiot. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, there's, not, there's nothing all that, you know, new and shocking about this. It's just further confirmation. And an, another thing was uh, that I thought was interesting in the Wolf book is uh, what he said about his relationship with Ivanka is that Ivanka is really um, acts as the wife. And, uh, yes, and Hope Hicks is his daughter. Yeah, yeah. This is getting into <laughs> some really uh, uh, strange <laughs> stuff because... Um, you know, the, the, the relationship, uh, between Trump and Ivanka, um, you know, nobody knows unless you're, you know, in that family, but there's certainly an appearance of something very unusual there, even going back to the time when she was between the ages of, say, 13 and 18. Uh, mm-hmm. some very suggestive photographs, uh, of the two, and, um, you know, I, Look, if it wasn't Donald Trump, anyone else would say, oh, that looks pretty bizarre, you know. But uh, he's been able to intimidate people to the point where they dare not say anything if they're if they're close to him. But um, uh, it, 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 those photographs are very, very uncomfortable. Well, and not to mention the, the creepy comments he's made to, like, Howard Stern yeah, about how he would Stern date on, his daughter. On The View, yeah. He yeah, started. on The View, yeah. It's like... Right, yeah. Uh, oh, and again, it's, can you, if you say, you know, again, Bill Clinton said that, we'd never hear the end of it. Um, you know, or, or Obama, or virtually any public figure. Uh, but for whatever reason, he gets this uh, weird pass. And this is, this is something I wanted to, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw to you first, Wayne, but, because you would um, mention this to me uh, when we were off air, I mean, is that a lot of what Trump is doing is really projecting. Um, and uh, I'm sure, you, you know, you were well aware of the, uh, you know, like the Pizzagate story originated yeah. during Katie Johnson's lawsuit. You know, absolutely. this was, you know, absolutely, you know, perfect timing. Imagine that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I find it interesting again now, um, uh, you know, we, have you seen this like QAnon, this, BS uh, for Ch- again on 4chan just like Pizzagate this yeah. guy who's supposedly feeding you know the deep state information and that Trump is going after the pedos and, and blah oh, blah blah uh, total nonsense not substantiated by anything you know I, I've been to Comet uh, Ping Pong uh, Andy we were both there right and I had been there before uh, and look it's a neighborhood pizza place it's on Connecticut yeah. Avenue in, in northwest Washington now granted uh, the people who live around here have, you know, have a bit of money because you have to have money to live in that particular area. We're talking about Embassy, Embassy Row, um, mm-hmm. or just outside of Embassy Row. And, um, but look, it's a place where people, you know, can walk to from their houses. Um, and, uh, so it's a neighborhood joint. And, uh, with, you know, without any, uh, corroborating information, no, no law enforcement information, no police report. They they targeted this place and another place nearby, <coughs> run by a poor uh, you know Afghan immigrant whose son happens to be in the uh, army, U.S. Army, uh, and uh, there were no repercussions. And then to make matters worse, some guy from North Carolina wants to find the basement torture chambers where they're allegedly torturing children. And um, and he uh, shoots up the place. He walks in with an AR-15 and shoots up the place. Um, 
the, you know, this type of thing is how these things start. But, but again, uh, you know, knowing that there is a police report about a kidnapping of a 11 year old girl standing in front of a pizza place, mm. it just seems to fit the pattern of, of, of projection. You take, you take something that, uh, Trump and his people are guilty of, and you put it on someone else. You focus on, uh, on someone else. Um, so, um, um, my biggest criticism was of people that bought and still continue to buy into this Pizzagate stuff is, um, okay, where, where's the evidence? You have no evidence of anything. Well, mm-hmm. well, by the way, I think it's worth mentioning, uh, that we went there with, uh, Wayne and I went there with, uh, Two friends of ours, both uh, who were big uh, uh, Donald Trump supporters, believed in Pizzagate, um, and um, uh, reasonably well-educated, have decent jobs. Won't go beyond that, but um, and they even looking at the floors. You know, it's a it's kind of a cement slab floor. Where there's obviously no, um, there's no subway tunnels down there. It's miles from the nearest yeah. subway tunnels. They, uh, we still, how would you characterize it, Wayne? They but still they, convinced they, that it was wrong because they bought into Pizzagate. Yeah. So much that just having a pizza there and being able to wander around it if they wanted, they still could not shake the unfaithable, shakeable faith that there was pizza game. Even though their senses should have told them otherwise, you know, they could, they could see the place, they could stand on the cement floor, they could see there was no stairway going underneath. Uh, even with all that, uh, and, 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 and the employees saying, no, we have no basement, their ears, uh, they, they wouldn't believe their ears, they wouldn't believe their eyes, they wouldn't believe their sense of, you know, of, of being there, uh, you know what? I don't know what more you can do with people like this. Uh, you know, uh, and you know, I mean, uh, it, it, look, the 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 circles where this nonsense is coming from. You know, also have put out information that um, NASA has a has a, a a torture facility on Mars where they're torturing mm-hmm. child sex slaves. You know, good. <laughs> you know, if you, if people believe this stuff. Because certain people out there in their community are telling them this, uh, I think it's uh, indicative of a wider problem um, with our country that uh, almost like some sort of auto-suggestive issue where all you got to do is say something and people automatically believe it. Well, and that's, I mean, that's what I'm seeing with this this uh, bogus QAnon story is that clearly – uh, Donald Trump hasn't been going after the people and draining the swamp the way he said he would. So now, lo and behold, some no, other he puts anonymous... Him, he, puts, he puts people in his cabinet. No, exactly. No, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> he, does, he surrounds himself with swamp creatures. Um, mm-hmm. So then you need to have another anonymous person on 4chan, which is such a pit of idiots, racists, and child pornographers, I'll, I'll add. Um, you know, it's, it's like, come on. Um, you know, and then he has to portray this even more ludicrous story that, that Trump is going to implement martial law, but it's okay because it's going to go after, you know, Hillary and George yeah. Soros and all of these people, you know, and it's... Well, sure. Trump is going to Davos where he will be rubbing shoulders with George Soros. Yeah, of course, absolutely. And, I mean, um, oh, God, who was... There's a bunch of people in his cabinet that got their start working for Soros. Um, I want to oh, say... Gold, yeah, Goldman Sachs is very... Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I guess here's my question for you guys. I mean, is, is how, how far can they, can, can they keep pushing the goal line with this? Because I mean, at some point, a year, two years from now, um, it, clearly nothing will have happened. You know, he's not going after all of these sexual trafficking rings. I mean, he's not, he's not taking down Jeffrey Epstein. Um, I mean, how far do you think these people are willing to go? Uh, I mean, are they just going to kind of accept this forever? That there's always an explanation? I mean, I don't know. What's your take on I, that? I don't. I don't know, Andy. You might have a better sense for it, but I don't know where his bet base bottoms out. I know Nixon when he resigned in 1974, his support was at 22 percent. 
that may be uh, Trump's bottom base. I don't know. It may, uh, it may be lower, maybe a little, a little higher. Right now, I think it's sit, sitting. What is it in the uh, mid to low thirties? No, actually, it's gone up. There's all this rhetoric that because the ordinary people, many of them, might get a few extra dollars this year, right, uh, <laughs> and and be screwed later. That people are only so he's actually uh, up in the high 30s on on average. Um, by the way, Chris Christie just left the office this week. I think today with a 14% approval rating <laughs> after being at 60 when he was re-elected in 2013. Uh, I think it'll go down, but I think uh, there's two types of supporters. One are the kind of oligarch, uh, puppet master level of supporters. And then there's the other the um, who are operating on gut instincts and who are ticked off you know, the kind of Tea Party supporters. But uh, I, I think that if as long as people operate on their gut instincts, uh, they're, they're going to be the last to know. And uh, in terms of the big shots, they're, they're stuffing their pockets. They're, they're making money on the stock market. The average person doesn't understand that the stock market doesn't necessarily help them uh, that much. It's um, you know, with all of the regular regulation going by the wayside, there are profits to be made, but that's for more of the big shots. Uh, um, so I don't know where it bottoms out. Uh, one of the uh, wild cards in this is um, th- there's s- such disasters going on in foreign policy and I think that's where a lot of the kind of oligarchs or, or powerful corporations you know they've they've worked decades to build up NATO and the military and um, they they don't like it to see uh, <laughs> this being thrown out and um, so that's that's an even bigger problem, I think, for Trump than uh, the polling, which can be manipulated. But, um, you know, this, when, you know, we're, we're putting armies, secret armies around the world at these bases to move into Africa. Wayne's written two books about Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of uh, important secret money that's gone into um, places like Africa to make it congenial for the U.S. business interests, and um, Trump is screwing it up. Maybe you might want to amplify on that. uh, uh, Well, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what kind of reception he gets at Davos. I mean, there's a report that certain European leaders will uh, confront him there, and it won't be a happy... uh, a happy uh, encounter, uh, specifically Merkel in Germany and Macron in France are both going to be there. Uh, but, um, you know, that, of course, they have their own issues, they have their own problems, but um, but for a guy who ran on conspiracy theories about, you know, globalist control and he's going to one of the uh, major conferences sponsored by the globalists for the globalists, <laughs> kind of defies logic. I I wonder what some of his anti globalist supporters out uh out there uh, in alternate media are going to say about this. Uh maybe oh well he had to get he had to get in there to uh you know fight them. I mean that's not how it works. I know. No, no, that is there that's always uh, well he's just appointing them because they they know how the uh you know yeah. the, the true sort of deep politics work. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm Wayne. I, I'd like to ask you, and feel free to, to decline if, if you if you don't feel comfortable. But I mean, do you think Alex Jones is is just, <laughs> I mean, completely just uh, just in it for the money? I mean, the way he pimps out Donald Trump and like everybody that comes on his show, they have to you know praise this piece of dirt. 
Um, what do you? I mean, I, I, you've well, been on I, the inside. I, 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 no, I I was associated with him. Uh, uh, you know, uh, beginning probably I did my first interview. It was actually a a live interview on tape in Washington D.C. I remember part of it was conducted right in front of the Federal Reserve Building. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that was probably 19, that was, I know it was before 9-11, I was 99 or 2000. So I've known him for a few years, not, you know, initially not well, I, but, you know, as time went on, uh, I knew him better and actually did a few stories, uh, for his, uh, for the Infowars. And, uh, but I have to say that, you know, it, it's very hard to, he's very hard to listen to, but I would go back to what, his attorney said in the child custody uh, right. case in Texas, he said he's into performance art. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. If you're a performance artist, then really he's no different than a guy who many people have long since forgot. Morton Downey Jr. had a show on TV in the 80s. <laughs> where he had Nazis on air in fights. And, you know, I mean, uh, he, he was, you know, I know Geraldo tried to uh, compete with him, but Morton Downey Jr. was the king of that uh, type of stuff, and and he wasn't serious, of course. None of his stuff was serious. So, um, you know, but Morton Downey Jr. Nobody knows who he is anymore, and mm -hmm. I think people who who go that route uh, are eventually going to find out that the act uh, the the act is not very popular anymore, and it's uh, you know people go on to other things. So I, I don't know it. But yeah, I mean, to, to hear ranting and raving about child sex colonies on Mars, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know why anyone would take uh, anything uh, like that or anything else on that program seriously. Um, and I know there's, you know, uh, there, there's a relationship between him, uh, Alex Jones and Roger Stone and, and, and through that relationship, a relationship with Donald Trump and, uh, but, um, I, uh, I, I just don't, uh, I don't follow really what goes on over there. Um, um, I get, you know, I get, uh, constantly, I'm trolled by people who are still fans of his. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I just have to continue to go on without that, um, you know, as, as some sort of, uh, you know, Bad influence or malefactor, uh, uh, and that's certainly um, the case with some of the other uh, people out there. You know, I mean, he does have this rabid base, uh, but when you look at you know the policies that Trump supports, I mean, I feel he's a racist. I mm. I, I went to the University of Mississippi ten years after. It took 30,000 federal troops to have one black guy admitted as a student. And I know racism when I see it. But, um, and it's, I'm not just picking on Mississippi. I, I was in a conversation earlier, uh, about the racism in Boston. Boston has always been considered one of the more racist cities in the United States. You just don't think so because, you know, what's there? Well, you got Harvard, you know, and, and mm -hmm. MIT in the area. And it's and in the Northeast. Education. It's a big education yeah. city, but, but, uh, there, there's been some horrible examples of racism there. Uh, so, um, but, you know, you know, you, when you see it, you know what it is. And, um, and, and, and of course the, you know, kowtowing to those people in Charlottesville was, was even beyond normal garden variety racism. It got into a much, a much deeper and darker area, I think. And, and, uh, so, um, yeah, uh, I mean, um, he, he's going to have his support. I don't know where it bottoms out. Um, uh, people are going to get a couple of bucks in their paycheck and they're going to pay, pay the piper later on that. Uh, but let's see where we're at. Uh, Let's see where we're at come um, later this year, especially as we gear up for the midterm election. Oh, certainly. Well, and and uh, it'll be fascinating to see who, you know, of the GOP is going to sort of stick around with uh, Trump as he becomes increasingly not, not, toxic. From, from the looks of Congress, not many. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's rare you see a, uh, an exodus of, of senior Republicans. These are people with seniority leaving uh, leaving especially the House, but also, as we know, see in the Senate. 
Mm. Oh, definitely. And uh, I mean, I found that so interesting with this whole, you know, comments that he had about African countries and El Salvador. I mean, you know, the people that were first talking about, they were all GOP senators. Yes, he absolutely said this. You know, we were all we were all shocked. Um, you know, Lindsey, so- Graham, Lindsey Graham today pretty much let the cat out of the bag and said him and uh, Durbin, who's a Democrat, went in there mm-hmm. with a, an agreement. But it was quite clear that Stephen Miller, this really bizarre guy who's very good friends with Richard Spencer, the, yes. the, the alt-right, the guy who developed the alt-right term, the, the white supremacist and neo-Nazi, uh, uh, helped sink it along with... Uh, this General Kelly, who's a Southie from Boston. I get right back to what I said before about, you know, there's some awful racists come out of that city. And, and it was Kelly who, uh, who really pushed this, um, uh, no deal on DACA thing. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's hardcore when it comes. Remember, he supported Trump in the campaign for that reason. Mm-hmm. Mostly that reason, and with other reasons, but he he hates him. He hates immigration. He used to be the head of the Southern Command in Miami, which is the U.S. command responsible for the Western Hemisphere. Hmm. Oh, and 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 Kelly is, of course, uh, I mean, an ardent Iran hawk. Um, you know, and he he helped push to get uh, A. West Mitchell in in the State Department, and is pushing this whole sort of uh, just psychotic. Hmm. Uh, regime change in uh, Iran and North Korea yeah. and other places like that. No, I mean, he's, yeah. not a nice, he's not a nice guy. He may be the only adult left in the room, but it kind of reminds me of the, you know, the last few days in the bunker in Berlin. Yeah, there were some. <laughs> yeah, there were some adults there. But <laughs> there were some adults there, but uh, you know, they were uh, they were all all with uh, you know Adolf right to the end. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, we'll still have to see if anyone wants to stick around Trump at the end. Um, we we are are fast approaching the end of the show, and I wanted um uh, both of you to again uh, tell people where they can go to uh, check out your work. But also, is there anything you want to leave the audience with? I mean, um, specifically about uh, your recent investigation into Trump and Epstein. Are you you know what's the next step for you guys? When when why don't you go first? Well, I'll just I'll just say that uh, the the investigation no investigation ever ends. <laughs> um, we um, you know there's there's information that always comes your way uh, later on that that, that can be uh, helpful uh, and help steer you in the right direction. Uh, Andy will talk about uh, our our next step to try to get all of that police report out of Waterbury, but uh, yeah, we're still monitoring. Uh, um uh that that case and uh so uh, that's why we said at the bottom of the article to be continued because it's not the end of the story by any stretch and um um so I'll hand it over to Andy to talk about the FOIA yeah um, <laughs> um well first uh Wayne broke the story it's uh his site is WMR um What's the full link, uh, Wayne? Uh, WayneMatsonReport.com. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yes, we're going to file a Freedom of Information. They'll probably jerk us around and try to do it a year or something like that. But um, uh, to speed things up, uh, I hope your listeners will uh, uh, spread the word on this to show some public support for this type of investigation and I'll mention uh, my site, uh, uh, justice-integrity.org. And if people just hit a like button, uh, either there or on Wayne's site, um, or a tweet or something like that, you know, we sh- we got to show these not only the police department, uh, but also the uh, citizens groups. You know, the people who care about kidnapped and abused kids, the state legislators, and ultimately people in Congress, that people care about this type of issue. Um, And they're not going to do it if it's just a blog story that comes and goes, because they don't want to tackle the kind of power structure that uh, pulls us off with Epstein, but they can easily do it if there's an aroused public. And I'm not saying a, a few more likes will do it, but there's already about 300 uh, on my site. And here's the last thing I'll just dangle on this. 
our information is that Robert Mueller, the special counsel, knows about this. Um, and uh, my experience as a lawyer for 25 years and being here in Washington is uh, it's not just the law is not just about balls and strikes. There's a political component. And they're not going to want to get into sex stuff, which is complicated, witnesses come and go, unless they think the public is behind it. But, um, you know, we can talk about war and peace. We can talk about graft, abuse of power. But uh, raping, kidnap kid or enticing them out of junior high school for massages uh, this is what government is supposed to get into. And uh, I hope that uh, your listeners are uh, as angry as we should all be, but I know they're angry and they wouldn't be listening to your show. But uh, w one simple thing to do about it is spread the word, including, by the way, I, I don't mean to make it only about Wayne and my uh, site, uh, a simpler way to do it, is to support your show and hit the like button right on your your show. Mm. Well, well, well I, I I thank you for the vote of confidence there, Andrew. Uh, and again, yeah, I mean this is uh, uh, I mean we, we we almost can't say it enough, but I mean people really need to be uh, spreading the word, especially about this. I mean this recent article, I mean is is a is a pretty big scoop. I mean you know uh, this woman Maria is alive. She is out there. If we were ever to get to a uh, a moment where we could start subpoenaing people and bringing in witnesses. I mean, she would be uh, of tremendous value, and um, and she might actually be able uh, to see some justice at the end of the this. Uh, what I can only assume has been a horrific journey for her. Um, sure. And uh, you know, I just like you like you were saying there. Definitely want to reiterate that to everyone to uh, talk about this, to spread, especially because um, the. The ways in which I mean, so many people talk about Epstein. It's it's only only if it has to do with Clinton. That's it. You know, there, there's nothing else. That's the only aspect of the story that that many people are willing to entertain. Uh, and there's yeah, that's the propaganda element. And I, and again, while we were talking, I looked up the name of the New Yorker writer I mentioned earlier. Her name is Gia Tolentino, and she's the one who wrote the article saying. Let's stop expecting these victims to carry the whole weight. We've heard their stories. We've got to do something. Mm. No, absolutely. And, you know, I think there are lots of ways of doing that. But, I mean, you know, we you need to kind of keep the pressure on. Um, and and uh, even if it's if it's a you know sort of a, not silly tactic, but I mean you know where are people at at these rallies uh, with signs you know asking uh, Trump these things? I mean no journalist. I mean the the Acosta thing. I don't believe he got questioned once during his hearing about. He got, uh, question, he got questioned a little bit, but uh, and and actually Wayne and I both wrote about that. And I know you're running out of time, but just very briefly. Uh, a couple people asked questions about it, but they really didn't drill down. And, and the way these hearings work is um, the the pressure groups wanted to ask them about labor issues, and and that's not the knockout punch. The knockout punch is why did you left, you know, uh, you know, uh, Epstein and 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 the Swiss bank and. Abramoff and these guys off the hook, not esoteric uh, labor policy. Well, absolutely, and that's always you know the the extent to which they they want to um, go after these people, um, and it almost seems like kind of like a song and a dance. Um, but uh, we are at the end of the the show. So uh, Wayne Madsen, Andrew Creek, thank you both so much for joining me. I highly encourage everyone to check out WayneMadsenReport dot com and Justice Dash Integrity. Dot org. Uh, so thank you guys for joining me. I'm going to have John Atak on the show hopefully next week. Um, so it'll be a great uh, discussion about Scientology and more topics. But until then, I will be talking to you very soon. No rules.
rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high food dose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. This is Rick Simpson, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. <laughs> American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network, and, uh, and we just need that so much. Assassination. You know what's interesting about assassination? Well, not only does it change those popularity polls in a big hurry, but it's also interesting to notice who it is we assassinate. Do you ever notice who it is? Stop to think of who it is we kill. It's always people who've told us to live together in harmony and try to love one another. Jesus, Gandhi, Lincoln, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John Lennon. They all said, try to live together peacefully. Bam! Right in the f- head. Apparently we're not ready for that. Yeah, that's difficult behavior for us. We're too busy thinking around, sitting around trying to think of ways to kill each other. Here's one we came up with. It's efficient, too. Genocide, you know? Killing large numbers of people simply because they don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they don't have the same kind of hats you do. <laughs> you ever notice that any time you see two groups of people who really hate each other, chances are good they're wearing different kind of hats. <laughs> Keep an eye on that, it might be important. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFR wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Prepare your mind to experience American Freedom Radio. 